All right, and welcome to episode 11. My name is Dr. Deepak Dugar. I'm a facial plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills. And I'm Dr. Jeff Toll, and I'm an internal medicine doctor. Let's get into it. All right, and welcome back. This is episode 11 of Modern Prescription. My name is Dr. Deepak Dugar. I'm Dr. Jeff Toll. And today we're talking about really cool stuff. We're doing a face-off, a plastic That's... surgery face-off. Thank... Finally. <laughs> Finally. Someone, someone to question me. Otherwise, Fall... I'm acting like the expert. Yeah. I, may, maybe you were just making it up the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's have a real a real expert Yeah, on. Jeff's like, does he even have a practice? <laughs> Is this guy real? I've been in there, I know. <laughs> But we have our first uh, plastic surgeon guest, which I'm really excited about, Dr. John Cabin. He's a friend, a colleague, and a close friend of mine in Jeff's. Yeah. And uh, we're super excited to have him on and talk to us about his expertise with all types of facial plastic surgery. He's an it expert It seems like he knows it. more than you. He does know more than me. I'll admit that 100%. <laughs> he knows way more than me. I only know about one little thing in the middle of the face, the yeah, nose. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, yeah, don't come to me for anything else. <laughs> but yeah, we're super excited. We're also going to answer some questions. So uh, we asked last week for you guys to ask up some questions, and we got some. So let's go through these. So uh, one question we got was, um, I am a baby boomer and a retired medical professional. What can I do to help with COVID in my community? What would you say? I think there's a lot that, that someone could do. Um, number one, uh, there's a virtual consult. So if this is a physician, they can absolutely you know, contribute and do virtual consults for people. Um, I think people are looking for guidance, whether they've been exposed, whether they have a fever, whether they think they may have been exposed. And sometimes they don't necessarily need to speak to a practicing physician, right. to, you know, whatever. Get basic advice. Basic yeah. advice like that. Or is it okay to go to the grocery store? Is it okay to be in the backyard with my grandchildren? Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and also just giving similar advice to friends and family in their community about how to be safe, how to socially distance safely, how to have a meal with your grandparents outdoors and be safe, things like that. Yeah. Um, so those are all different ways. I think whether you're an RN, whether you're a physician, if you know how to keep sterility or keep, you know, clean. And those are, those are helpful ways to contribute. Yeah. I think that's great. I, I completely agree. I think, you know, your local church, mosque, temple, uh, those are obviously great resources. A lot of them are closed right yeah. now, but they still have community guidelines, uh, you know, online bulletins, email uh, lists that are going out. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can contribute and ask to write a little column for it and yeah. give your little advice for COVID and just make sure that people know you're available um, to give advice, uh, even though it's not going to be professional advice if you're no longer working, but at least it could be some, uh, you know, sage advice. And if it needs to go to professional, of course, you'd be the best person you, to guide them. Probably any random person would be better than the CDC guidelines I'm yeah. right now. So. <laughs> you don't agree with those anymore? They're just <laughs> useless. I mean, they're just telling, now they're telling people to not test after they've been I exposed. heard, yeah. What is the deal with that? Well, <laughs> the orange guy wants there to be less, um, the president. He wants, he wants, I think they do. He, he wants there to be statistically less cases as the election is kind of getting closer to be able to say, mm. look, we fixed it. There's less cases. Mm -hmm. And a very good way to have less cases on the books is to test, not test people who are, were exposed. So other than that, I can't really think of a good reason not to test people who were exposed. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good because point. Because I, in a way, and this is a little counterintuitive, I actually think testing people who are exposed is actually more important than testing symptomatic people. Mm. Because if someone is symptomatic, you could argue they should assume they have it and stay at home and quarantine the full 14 days or until you know five days after their symptoms have resolved. And if they're sick enough, they should see a physician. But really, the test itself isn't that helpful. Right. Whereas if someone's been exposed to someone they need to know whether they have it or not to not expose other people. Right, right, and right. So, that makes total sense. So in a way, I would argue they are exactly who needs to be tested. Right, right. I completely agree. Um, and that leads into the next question. Someone asked, can you get COVID twice? Um, like knock, knock wood, so far, there's been very few cases where we even think it was possible and maybe one or two where we actually think it happened. Mm. I probably would have had it twice already if you could. Yeah, you're, you're the COVID uh, king. Um, High exposure. But, but, but you know, I think 
so far, you know, the pandemic started in, you know, January, December, maybe even. We don't know exactly. So we're yeah. eight months out. The other coronaviruses, we know people are typically immune for about a year or two. Mm -hmm. So we're worried that theoretically at some point, yes, you could be uh, get it again. We're hopeful that the vaccines are likely to come out before people potentially are losing their immunity. Mm -hmm. So even if people have had it before, I probably would still, once we find, you know, there's arguments to be made that we need to make sure the vaccine is safe before yeah. we start using it. Right. But um, assuming it's safe, for myself, I had it, yeah. but I still plan on getting a vaccine, vaccine once I think it's a safe vaccine. Yeah, me too. And then that leads to another question we got, which is, if I'm going to get the vaccine, should I wait a few months until people have gotten it before I get it? This is a great question. Um, so in the studies that they're doing, they're pretty well able to determine whether there are short-term side effects. So. Mm -hmm. They're already studying this in tens of thousands of people with the various different vaccine options. So they may be able to tell how likely is it that you have a bad allergic reaction? How likely is it that you have something like Guillain-Barre, which can happen from the flu vaccine, which can cause a neurologic side effect? The The answer we don't have is what's the possibility you have some long-term right. autoimmune disease develop or something else that we can't say. And so waiting one to two months after you let some friends get it, may not answer that question, really. Yeah. It may show some more stuff. So I think it depends on your, again, I always talk about risks and benefits with mm -hmm. anything in medicine. And so what's your risk of getting the vaccine and what's the potential benefit? And then on the flip side of the coin, what's your risk of not getting yeah, absolutely. the vaccine? Not getting it, yeah. And what's the possible benefit of not getting it? So yeah. if you're in a high risk group, if you're 80 and have diabetes and we're a smoker, you're so high risk if you got COVID that right. you're willing to accept risk from the vaccine because it's it's less risk. It's worth it. You're you're easy. So I think anyone in a nursing home, anyone at highest risk definitely should be, they deserve to get it first because they're at the highest risk, but also they're the lowest, the risk benefit ratio is best for them. Right. I agree. And I think there's a large... Uh, consortium of people in this country right now who still to today think COVID's fake and they 100% would never get the vaccine, at least that's what they're saying, yep. and don't think that we should be wearing masks. I mean, there's a large consortium of people. And all I say to those people is that, fine, you know, you're allowed to have your viewpoint. It's not true, <laughs> but you're allowed to have your viewpoint. But the vaccine itself, understand the vaccines are heavily researched. There's no vaccine that's going to be released. Like Russia released their vaccine, right? Maybe well, not heavily researched. Well, Ours will I, be before it comes out. I mean, I I will say I'm worried because I want everyone to get the vaccine, but we know that this administration is willing to take shortcuts on things and we know they're willing to say, don't test yourself. And so the, they may be more willing to push through something that hasn't be, been as rigorously studied, to be mm -hmm. honest. But again, if you're you know if you're high risk, the risk benefit ratio is with you that it's worth it to take. Yeah. The question is going to be for the other people, and you know it's difficult difficult question. Yeah, great. And then the last question we got <clears throat> another one. This is uh, unfortunately won't be able to go through all of them, but the next one we got that we can go through is. At what point should I see a doctor for pain, such as neck pain or shoulder pain? So basically, if you have like a little ache in your ankle or your neck and you just kind of feel a crick, at what point should you see a doctor? So we, so if anything is either severe pain, like greater than 8 out of 10, you probably should see a doctor. Mm -hmm. If anything has any neurologic symptoms, so if you have tingling or weakness or numbness, so if your neck hurts, that's one thing. But if you feel shooting pains down your arm or numbness in your fingertips, so if there's a neurologic component to it, the reason why that makes a difference is there may be some urgency to fixing it. So if you have you twist your neck and your neck's stiff mm -hmm. and the pain is just sort of in the neck, but there's no neurologic symptoms, it's probably musculoskeletal. Could it be a disc or something else? It could be, but the time if you waited for a few days or a week to find out if it got better, you're okay. Right. Whereas if there's a neurologic deficit, like weakness, like you can't lift your arm up, like numbness, tingling in the fingertips or something like that, then 
you may need it may be a disc pressing on a nerve that you need to fix sooner than later or else right. it could become permanent right great so advice that's, that those those are typical signs that you need to yeah see a doctor and i would say the other thing is if the pain even if it's low level even if it's not severe pain but it's chronic oh. like if it doesn't go away and you feel like you're having this low level pain chronically I think uh, very undervalued in America is physical therapy. Physical therapists are phenomenal yep. human beings. God bless them all. Yep. Uh, we'll have one on the show soon. Uh, but physical therapy is so undervalued and underrated. And most people, if, you know, if you have insurance, uh, even if you don't, but if you have insurance, usually it's covered. And so you can see a physical therapist and kind of work the kinks out and understand some of the uh, musculoskeletal problems from your shoulders, your neck. Um, this is a little life hack that I personally am doing. I see a physical therapist twice a week. Really? Yeah, and I because I have uh, some little joint issues, pain issues in random places, and I think it's just because of years of doing surgery and mm-hmm. just the way that I'm positioned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've been seeing a physical therapist twice a week, and it's the best thing I ever did. You literally get a 30 minute something massage, and then they do exercises and train your body yeah. to to learn the techniques you need to do to improve those pain areas. So I think um, yeah, if you have temporary pain that's only for a few days and goes away, it's all good. But if it's eight out of ten or causing significant side effects, like Dr. Toll was suggesting. And or if it's chronic and not getting better after a few weeks, I think you should definitely see somebody. And if it's a chronic pain that's not si- significant, like you're suggesting with the symptoms, yep. then physical therapy might be the best way physical to start. Physical therapy and blood boys. And blood boys. Yeah. If you didn't <laughs> listen to last week, you got to go back. Everyone needs a blood boy. That'll fix it up. That's another major life hack. I haven't gotten to that yeah. level yet. Yeah. Right. Now I'm at the physical therapy level. I can't wait till we get blood boys during oh, during man. a filming. Would you get a Jewish blood boy? Of course. That's not racist. Kosher. I'm just asking. Kosher. Yeah, because yeah, you need kosher blood. Yeah. yeah I would get I'd probably get a little Hindu blood boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm super excited. We're going to introduce. <laughs> I'm super excited. We're going to introduce our guest for the day, Dr. John Cavan. Stay with us. All right. And so we're welcoming and bringing on a very special guest today. We finally have a real uh, facial plastic surgeon here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Not just a TV doctor. <laughs> we have a real actual facial plastic surgeon. Well, it's true because I am just a nose surgeon. That's, That's that it, is true. You know? He has so a lot of skills. He has way Hold on, more the skills. The nose is part me. of the face. The, the nose, nose is part, part of the face. Of the well, let's introduce the fantastic, fabulous Dr. Jonathan Cabin. The one and only. Double board certified facial plastic surgeon. In Beverly Hills, taking care of some of the most elite patients for all of their facial plastic surgery needs. And we're super excited to hear from you and learn from you today. Thank you. Thank you for the instruction, guys. Thanks for having me. I feel like I'm hanging out with the the cool kids today. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) It is true. (laughs) But we're happy to have you. And so tell us, uh, you know, you run a practice where you do a multitude of things. You know, it's, it's very different from my type of practice where I'm super niche. Yeah. So tell us, what, what is your specialty and what kind of procedures do you do? And then we'll d- dig deep into it. I love it. So, um, yeah, I do rhinoplasties, obviously. Yeah. We do different kinds of rhinoplasties, and we can talk about that, yeah. which is a big portion of the of the practice. Um, facelifting, eyes, anything head and neck that's um, cosmetic, rejuvenative, non-surgical stuff as well. So kind of runs the gamut of things that are, you know, rejuvenating, cosmetic, keeping people young and healthy, look, making them look natural. And then reconstructive stuff as well, people with lacerations, trauma, cancer, and those kinds of things. So wow. it, it really runs the gamut. But, um, you know, we... we you know, we overlap a bit. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And uh, w- you are a contributor and writer for Doximity, and you've written a couple of really cool kind of landmark articles that have really gotten a lot of popularity. <laughs> I so, don't know if I call them landmark, but they- Well, they, for the people reading good. them, it is. Um, so tell us, you know, the one that I thought was really cool, you have one about uh, surgeons being like athletes, which I always talk about all the time, like every episode, I'm trying to compare myself. I. What about the fact that I'm the best athlete in the room? That's true, actually. Well, I don't know. Sure. Do you play sports? I don't. Okay. I'm, I'm going to so give then, Jeff yeah, that award. <laughs> anyway, right. let's get Mario back on the Why show. Why are all doctors like athletes? Uh, I guess surgeons are like athletes. We think we are at least. Yeah. But what was, the other article was really cool too. Tell us about that one. So yeah, I um, you know, I dabbled in a little writing, and I wrote an article. I was noticing sort of the, or I was struggling myself with a lot of the um, dichotomy in social media. Right, we're doctors. Ah. We want to help people. We want people to feel good, and yeah. I felt like. On the one hand, social media was an incredible outlet for educating patients about what we do and giving them positive content for things that they can, you know, they can learn from. And then the flip side was I was noticing in my own life personally with my friends and family, some of my patients, that there was a lot of wasted time and energy on social media. And so I was kind of trying to process that by writing about it. And and one of the, the conclusions of the article was like, for me personally, I think there's value in it if you're sharing 
um, things that are of value to other people. And you have to be careful with yourself, with your patients about um, going too far and making it sort of a, a consumerism of, of empty content that just wastes people's time. So that, that was kind of what, what I, I didn't really make a, a, a database conclusion. It was like a mental conclusion, but um, yeah, that's great. Me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good observation because I think all of all doctors and I think all consumers, all patients, when they were looking at their doctors online, we all struggle with like what to put on social media, yeah. and what not to put on social yeah. media. Yeah. You, you used to be really good about doing case of the day and really, yeah, pushing you know, that. when I think when I was uh, in my residency and then when I first started my practice, I had more time. Mm-hmm. It sounds weird to have time in your residency, but I was in the hospital like on a shift. Right. And there's like a few minutes of downtime here and there where you could post or whatever. Yeah. Sleep. And it's a lot different yeah. <laughs> when you're not only seeing patients, running a business, you just have less time to think about it. Yeah. You know, it, it drops down on the list. So I do try, you know, I think it's important to kind of communicate what type of physician you are, what your belief systems are Mm -hmm. and what you, what just makes you, you, because it's such a medicine is such a personalized thing. So you guys are both facial surgeons, but you have a different approach. And Mm -hmm. I think both of you are similar in the sense that both of you are really care about your patients and both of you really want the best for them. And neither of you guys are the type of plastic surgeons who will just like get someone in and, you know, make, you know, do whatever they want yeah, if you don't think buck. it's good for them. Yeah. No. And, and that's, I think why all of us get along well and yeah, agree with but, each other in that sense and send each other patients. Um, and so if you're able to get that across on social media, that can be very valuable to your practice and letting people know who you are. Right. And, some doctors have varying levels of comfort in yeah. front of a camera, comfort in front of, yeah. you know, get, putting themselves out there. So right. how, is that something that you felt has been difficult for you? I mean, definitely going yeah. into plastics. I mean, I first of all, I admire you guys because you're kind of the doctors I look to to emulate because you guys have been so good at putting that out there and, and creating value, I would say, not oh, content. Oh, man, so sweet. I'm trying to get him to join TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> don't I go there, I just don't want China to know where I am. All your <laughs> I feel like he's got some dance moves under this. <laughs> when I run for president, China's going to be able to... <laughs> <laughs> to win the to swing the election because I can't you know wait are you on TikTok I'm TikTok? on TikTok yeah, oh yeah. really yeah how's that going uh, it's fun I <laughs> yeah. TikTok yeah I mean I don't I don't do the dances and stuff you know? like, I do I do social media my way like yeah. I don't I don't I won't just like conform because I feel like I don't know maybe this is wrong of me. I don't think doctors should be dancing on social media. <laughs> and that's Agreed. totally wrong yeah. of me to say. Like no, I it's see. wrong. It's wrong. They're allowed to dance. They can dance. I just don't <laughs> want to. I'm not dancing on social media. And so I post content that I like on social right. media, but I don't do the dances. Like I don't follow yeah. the, you know, so I just post yeah, cool but, videos and music. But I think if you're like, for you, you're funny in real life. Yeah, And so you. when you're fun, when you make a funny post or something, that's yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that, is part of, you know, some patient may want a doctor who's funny that makes them feel comfortable. Right. And some patients may want a doctor who's serious as you can yes. get. Yeah, absolutely. Because they think that that's who's going to take serious their procedure and that's what makes them feel comfortable. Absolutely. That's and so a great point. I think. Great point. What I, my advice to everyone in whatever field you're in is if your social media is part of your professional what's out there you're it used to be you had a sign post above your store saying yeah. you know doctor's office yeah but now that this is what you have that that's really what you're getting across is who who are who who am i yes yeah yeah you that's know? a really good point i think i've noticed with friends of mine like you guys for example built super successful practices and one of the ways you did it was by bringing in the right patients through social media patients that align with you and when you're trying to do social media like everyone else or do some sort of branding thing yes. you end up probably if anything attracting people that aren't really the right fit so right yeah. and so when you Genius. when i think when my doctor friends i've talked to about this when they think of i got to do something on social media it needs some kind of yeah. branding yeah and content. it's not authentic, yeah. authentic and yes. it's not really them they like hire someone to post for them yes then it doesn't translate into because for me it's like someone watches my stuff or reads they totally agree with the way i see the world right and then they come to me and then their friends or the people they are around are probably of like mind also. Yeah. And so it just kind of goes that way. I yeah, think. no, but I think that's perfectly worded the way you said it. Like if you're authentic, you're going to draw people similar to you. Totally. If you're unauthentic on social media, you're drawing random people that you may not even want in your practice. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing is doctors, like now that we've all, we all have great practices now, 
it's when you know when you're younger and starting out, you're kind of nervous and shy about it because you also don't know. You know, you're, you're kind of hyper competitive in a bad way. Versus once you right. build a practice and you get busy enough, you're kind of like, well, there are tons of patients out there. Like I can't handle, I can't see them all, even if I wanted to. Right, like, totally. And then you get more selective in a good way, where you're kind of like, all right, there's a lot of good doctors. You're kind of pushing, you know, no, 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 go see another doctor. It's great. You know, I tell every patient one one of my favorite things, no matter what go see another consult yeah, totally. and they love, love it because they get so confused in a way, but <laughs> I genuinely mean that. Like, yeah. I don't want you to book surgery with me just because I was really charming and have a great plan for you. Yeah. There may be someone even more charming with even better plan. Totally. And the only way to know that is to see multiple consults. And I think sometimes it confuses them. Um, but I love doing that because I just want okay. them to really go out there and shop. It's like a boyfriend or it's like yeah. a girlfriend. Yeah. You don't just go on one date. Right. You know, it's a yeah. lifelong decision. Uh, yeah, getting married. I, my, my thing with patients too, I go, I, I say to them, look, I want you to feel absolutely comfortable with me rolling into yeah. the OR. And if there's someone else out there you feel more comfortable with, you'll have a better outcome. Yes. Because the mindset 100%. going in is just as important yep. as my skill or what happens in the operating room. Yeah. So now that we're on the subject of, subject of skill, Ooh. Yeah. Oh. so te- we got to compare who's doing what, what's yeah. the difference in, 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 uh, in your guys' uh, nose approach. Nose, nose approach. All right. right. All right. So Dr. Cabin, you take it away. What's, what are, what are the, what, what's the difference between your, our approaches for nose jobs? So Deepak is a closed rhinoplasty master. Ooh, I will give him thank that. Thank you. No, you're very um, kind. I'm trying no, he's, to be. It, I learn a lot from him. <laughs> thank um, you. I've gone to the OR with him, actually watched him yeah. operate. To yeah, learn some we, I, I love it. It's so, so much fun. And there's really, you know, there's a lot of discussion of closed versus open versus scar. The main difference is that the surgery that Deepak does is um, without a little incision in the yeah. middle portion of the nose, yeah, which no big deal. results in a shorter operating room time. Uh, less swelling mm-hmm. and uh, less of you know visibility after surgery. Although yeah. I will argue that the scars usually disappear, but always. But what I tell patients surgeons, is the, yes. the biggest thing with closed rhinoplasty is is not the scar, although no, we talk about not. that. Yeah. But it's the shorter OR time mm-hmm. and it's the the reduction of recovery because yeah. you're you're not disrupting as much tissue. Yes. But you will admit we've talked about this and you've sent me patients before. Of course. And I've sent you patients before where um you know there's some things you cannot do through closed. hundred percent. Yeah. It's and very so, limited in, in a lot of ways. You have to do open rhinoplasty for a lot of things. So yeah. open rhinoplasty, what Dr. Cavan does is where they make a cut at the bottom of the nose, lift up the hood of the nose, and then you can actually reconstruct the nose and see all the structures of the nose to really put it together exactly how you want it. You get a yeah. little bit more precision with your final abilities. The key is some patients are better suited for closed, totally. some are better suited for open. And what I have been really proud of with my practice is being super honest about it. Like I, yeah. I literally turn away about 30% of my consults who need open rhinoplasty and I just don't do them closed because they're just better suited for open. Yeah. And then there's another 10, 15% I turn away because they just don't need surgery. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I do not operate on people who just don't need it or mentally don't have the stability to get surgery. Because yeah. I think plastic surgery does require a certain mental stability to have. Um, Agreed. Yeah, it's like a Lamborghini. If you can't afford gas, you can't afford the you know the the, the tire changes, <laughs> don't buy a Lambo. So yeah. that's a bad example, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I think some people, uh, I think what you're getting at is if they're looking for surgery to make them happy, happy. or stable or something. Yeah, yeah it's not and it. And they're very unstable before. Yes. It's, unlikely to help at all and it may make things worse exactly and so i have rarely done this but occasionally when i if i'm doing a preoperative clearance for someone i will tell the plastic surgeon or whatever that i think mentally this we should wait yes they're we work on this part and then see if they're ready later on yeah Yeah. absolutely do you ever get clearances have you ever have you ever felt the need where you're like "Ah, i'm just not sure and you want to get a clearance a psychiatric clearance for a patient if I'm not sure, I'm not going to do the surgery. Yeah. Best advice. Um, seriously. Yeah. I mean, it's just not worth it. I mean, you know, you talk to guys and they'll operate, you know, on on a lot of different patients that I won't. And it's just not worth the aggravation, the headaches, being up at night. And I think for, for what we do, we're doctors at the end of the yeah. day, right? Like you can argue about cosmetic surgery and is it doing a service to the world? I happen to think it is, but you have to focus on the right patients. Yeah. And you and I both agree on that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not for everyone. And no. And we, you know, and it's also in self-interest. You don't want to build a practice of patients who are just never going to be happy and they thought they're going to be happy because you fixed their nose or gave them a facelift or whatever it is. What, so. what do you, who do you find the patients are the happiest afterwards? Is it a, fa- a facelift on a 
60-year-old woman that you did or is it uh, a nose or is it injectables? Like if you had to pick like who's like, they're always super happy the minute I take off the bandage or whatever. I think facelifts are are honestly like the most consistent because you're, mm. you know, it's, it's, there's lots of different ways to do it, but in general, you're just making someone look younger if you do yeah. it, if you do it well. Yeah. Um, and, and that you can't really go wrong there. Um, you know, rhinoplasty is complex. You, you and I will both, both agree that there's so much education before the surgery about yeah. swelling, about all the things that are going to happen afterwards. It's very personal because the nose makes up so much of your personality and yes. your face. So you have to be careful there. And there are patients afterwards that are struggling with their new nose. They don't know how it looks on their face. Eventually you hold their hand through it. And, and for the most part, they're happy. But I think there, there's a lot more psychology around the nose than other things we do, which mm, I think- Interesting. Do you think part of it is that they're younger yeah. patients? The patients are younger? It's possible, yeah. It's possible. I also think that, you know, a lot of the studies show that with the nose, you know, there's something called um, body dysmorphic disorder, which mm -hmm. we, we deal with all the time where people are overly obsessed with things. And the nose happens to be one of the major focuses of that kind of thing. So- you have to be really selective and, and look out for that when you're when you're talking to patients. Yeah, body dysmorphic disorder, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, that basically means that you are obsessed with a part of your body or more than one part of your body that is not in a healthy level. Like some people are obsessed with the bump on the nose. They shave down the bump, they're gone. The obsession's yeah. over. But some people just have this unhealthy obsession with their body and it, it becomes to the point where they're doing reckless behavior, yep. whether it's emotionally, the way they talk to people, the way they treat themselves, the way they diet, the way they uh, are becoming anorexic. So who's like a, is Michael Jackson, is that an example? Definitely. De yeah. would, you, would you agree with that, Dr. Kevin? I think so, yeah. yeah. I think he's, you know, that's a classic, like chasing something yes. and just continuing to chase it right. when yeah. you've already crossed that bridge of disaster. Yeah. And I think he also, had a lot of nose, speaking of nose jobs, a lot right? of nose jobs. Michael Jackson's probably the, you know, he's funny. It's, it's, he's the most commonly brought up celebrity in my practice. Really? Because, I don't want to I'm surprised your, your TikTok uh, people <laughs> know who Michael Jackson is. <laughs> you know what's funny? How <laughs> good would, for, can I just yeah. change the subject for one second? Yeah. How good would Michael Jackson have been on TikTok? Oh my, oh my God. God. Oh the my dancing. God. Oh my God. For 30 for seconds. Wouldn't have even been fair. He, yeah. It wouldn't so have there's been no one like that right now. Yeah. I guess Usher was the next. Usher yeah. was great. But he kind of fell off He's a little bit. He's older now. He's older. Yeah. But like, I feel like he didn't stay consistent with his music either. He kind of got, yeah. and I don't want to say lazy, but yeah. he also made a lot of money off Justin was, Bieber. Probably. Justin Bieber was his guy. Is he? Yeah. He signed Usher. Oh, I so didn't that's know what, that. So Usher was making tons of money without making music. Wow. Well, that's lazy. always a better way to go. Yeah. Like what Dr. about Timberlake? Dre? Is Timberlake still in the game? He could, yeah, he what happened to Timberlake? Like, he was good. He was the next good one. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if he's on. Yeah, TikTok. what happened? Anyway, they started doing movies. I don't know. So, um, um, but what was? Yeah, so back to. Sorry about that. No, no, Michael Jackson. <laughs> I would say you <laughs> know everyone really always asks. Like I did an interview yesterday with Financial Times in London, and they were asking me who's the most requested nose that you always get asked about, and I was, it's funny. I was like, okay. Let me get back to that one. But I get the most requested nose. They don't want yeah. everyone brings up Michael Jackson. And it's just funny. It's guys, girls, like everyone just ubiquitously is like, yeah. I just don't want to look like Michael though. I don't want to look do like Michael Jackson. Do people do that? Do they bring in? I'm so curious about it. Do people bring to you yes. guys a photo and say, I want to look like this? Is that what they do? They do. They do. And that's, that's it, to me, it's like a mini red flag okay. when you come in with, because it, it's kind of, you know, what, my philosophy, and again, this this is different practice to practice, is that you, I want to make you look more like yourself, a better a, you, a better you, more yeah. natural, you know. And and when you're when you're emul trying to emulate some celebrity out there, it's more likely that you're potentially doing it for the wrong reasons. I'm yeah. not gonna I'm I not gonna make a blanket statement. That's really yeah, why yeah. I love both of you guys and why I send you guys patients and stuff is because the, it's you guys really believe that and and practice that way. Oh, totally. And, it's the, you know, there's, there's a certain look, right. That's popular right now. Yeah. And the Kim Kardashian, the Kim Instagram Kardashian look, kind yeah. of look. And, uh, and she's beautiful, but, but I, not everyone needs to look like her. Right. There is only one Kim K. You can't, you can't yeah. be her. Yeah. You, you <laughs> gotta be. Yeah. You gotta and be a lot of these trends, like the, the Gigi, uh, what's her name? Hadid, the eye, the, the, the lift, the chin, you know, yeah. people come in asking for that and the eyebrow lift, the yeah, eyebrow yeah. lift. And it's like, you know, you got to. You, you know, there's so much that you don't see, like the airbrushing of the photos and the contouring makeup. And then that procedure, I don't know if that's going to look good five, 10 years down the line, right. you know, yeah. but it's a trend now and you right. never want to hop on the trend and, bandwagon with plastic surgery. And so it's one thing Green if advice. you're going into your hairdresser with something and because yeah. it's going to last for a month or two yeah, and then totally. you change it up 
Totally. When the trend changes. Yep. But when but your, your face, face is uh, not uh, permanent. Shot there. permanent. And I agree with you, Seth. I think it's a little red flag when they bring in celebrity photos, but I love it. I love it because if they show me, talk about it. yeah, because because it, it, well, first of all, because if they show you a celebrity and it's totally a different person than they are, it's awesome. Because I know that yeah. the next fifteen minutes, I just need a chit chat <laughs> to get them out of my office. I'm never gonna touch that person. I'm never gonna operate on them. You know, yeah. but if they show me a celebrity who actually made. looks like them, yeah, it's super yeah. easy. They make the decision for me. But if they show me a photo and it kind of looks like them, it is yeah. kind of you know, and the, the anatomy is similar. That it helps me understand what their desire is. Yeah. You know, so I, I like that part. And do you do uh, morphing in your office? I do. Yeah, so yeah. that I found has been so helpful. And for anyone listening, if you ever get a plastic surgery consult, uh, morphing technology is kind of the new way to go now. There's all different ways from, you know, simple things like Facetune on the iPad all the way to like these complex $300,000 machines called Vectra. But the key yeah. is that we do it. I And I always say I do it for myself. I'm not even doing it for the patient because totally. I'm I'm literally doing the surgery while I do it to make sure I can actually achieve these results. Mm. And then if the patient looks at it and likes it, perfect. We're on the same page. If they look at it and don't like it, perfect. We're on the wrong page. Either way, it's perfect. Yeah. And then they leave and they get surgery somewhere else, you know, or don't get surgery. But and the the whole thing with morphing, I always bring it up like this. I say, this is to guide our conversation. Yeah. We it's very hard to talk about a nose because we usually mostly use morphing for noses without having some sort of representation of what we're talking about. I can talk about deep projecting the tip and taking down the bump, but if you're not seeing it on the screen, it's very hard to talk about. So it's it's, yes. it's almost like a crutch with the conversation yeah. of a way to explain to someone what your vision is. Yes. And, and I agree, if, if your vision doesn't align with yours, you're probably not the right yeah. Surgeon. Yeah. And so, I love that moment. Yeah. I, I love that moment just as much as I love the moment where we do align. Like yeah. I love that. Cause it's just about efficiency. Like, you know, with work, with life, with time, I, I feel bad for patients too. Sometimes I'll have patients send in photos, not always, but sometimes if they've had like a revision, I'll have them send in photos just for me to review it ahead of time. So I can tell them don't even do a consult. Yeah. You know, because I don't want to waste their time. I don't yeah. want to waste my time. So efficiency, I've, I've found, is the one thing. What do you do with facelifts? I'm so curious. How, do, how does a facelift consult work if you guys can't do morphing? Um, a lot of it just comes to standing behind them and pulling their skin up with your hands. Oh, cool. I'm and they look kidding. in the mirror? <laughs> that's, that's a small piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think, you know, you talk about what you're achieving. You talk about how you're going to do the surgery, what the telltale signs of aging are. So a lot of people come in and they say, I'm looking a little older and I think I need a facelift, but they don't really know what a facelift does. Mm. And so my job is to educate them. What does a facelift do? What parts of your face are we treating? Why is volume important versus lifting? You know, there's this whole idea that you're lifting, but a lot of what a facelift is also is, is replacing volume in areas that have lost volume. What is that? What do you mean by that? So um, two things. One is when you're doing a facelift, you're moving certain fat pads upward or diagonally, right? So you're putting them back to where they were and not where they are now creating shadows that make ah, you look older. So a lot mm. of, you know, the, the, the concept with fillers, for example, or surgery is that you're basically manipulating shadows on the face because shadowing is one of the cues to the human eye that someone is of a certain age, right? Shadowing under the eye, shadowing near the chin, shadowing near the nose. And so you explain that this is not about filling wrinkles or smoothing out wrinkles. The wrinkles are, are the skin. That's like the paint job. The, the real work is by replacing those those sort of fat pads to where they need to be so that someone doesn't have that same shadowing. And then if they've lost weight, a lot of weight, or if they've sort of atrophied some of their muscles, you can do some fat grafting as well at the same time where you're adding some fat maybe from their abdomen or their inner thighs that they may have in very small amounts. We're not talking about like liposuction type amounts, uh -huh. very small amounts to kind of improve a little bit more of the shadowing. Cool. So fat grafting with face. So facelifting means removing the skin and pulling it back. Yeah. And then you're also adding some fat injections to fill the areas that you might feel are void. Totally. And empty. the skin is, you have to think about with a facelift, the skin is is the surface. Mm -hmm. But what you're really lifting is below the skin. It's, an, it's a layer of the face called the smas. And if you just lift up the skin, which is the way facelifts were done when they first started talking about them, um, you'll look good for maybe two or three months, and then you'll start to have widened scars because the scars are under tension. Um, you'll start to lose a lot of that lift. What you really have to do is pull it up with the fascia and the muscle underneath, and then you just sort of lay the skin down and trim whatever's extra. And when you're closing a facelift, when you know you've done it right, is when the skin is literally sitting next to each other on no tension, and all you're doing is putting stitches in to put the edges together. That's pretty cool. I, I want a facelift. That sounds great. <laughs>
<laughs> we'll do it right after this. We'll do it. Right. <laughs> so, no, right well, hopefully, I don't need one yet. <laughs> yeah. You're beautiful, Jeff. Come Thank on. you. That's true. <laughs> what, what do you think about these people that do like awake facelifts? Is that something you do? Is that a thing? I don't. I think it's fine to do yeah. it. It's just not for me. I'm more comfortable when the patient's asleep. I like to be really focused. Yeah. Um, I find when when a patient's awake, they're you know they're laying a certain way for a while, and there's a lot of management there. There's obviously a little bit of risk with anesthesia, and I get that. And some patients come to me and they want an awake facelift, and I just I'll I'll send them to one of my colleagues who do yeah. them, um, but you know I, I want to be I want to be super comfortable and focused when I'm operating. And if a patient's not asleep, it distracts me. Yeah. Um, I find anest general anesthesia these days is like super super safe, but super I get safe. it if you're if you're not up for it. Um, yeah. But people that do them and are comfortable with them, like it's great. It's a great tool in your pocket. There's nothing. I'm, I have nothing against it. Just for me personally. What's Doctor Cabin's operating room like? Is it quiet? Is it, are people talking? Is there music? <laughs> Yeah, my operating room. I'm like, I went from like reggae. I used to be on a reggae mode nice. operating. Now I'm doing like, I, I sort of have a little jam band in me. So I do some Grateful Dead sometimes. Something that's like relaxing, repetitive, quiet. Grateful Don't like Dead. a lot of comfort. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> You're so white. I love it. <laughs> I was gonna Sorry, guess, I'm not admitting that. I was going to guess <laughs> classical music. For some I did jazz for a while, which was fantastic. Yeah, jazz is, sounds cool. Yeah. I don't like, I'm this, like, I'm one of those people I can't work in a coffee shop without headphones. Like, I like quiet. I like focus. Like, people try to talk to me when I'm operating. I get annoyed. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, I like, like, a ambient, ambient good music. Right. You're Even right. though I'll listen to hip-hop in the car or whatever, like, that's not my kind of operating music. You're right. What do you do? Do you have off, office music? So, I definitely do not operate ever. No, no, no. But do you <laughs> On the rare music? occasion, I do a small procedure. Because uh -huh. I used to, like, I'll open up a abscess, yeah. little Good small you. one. Yeah, you'll do, you'll like do a stitch. I'll you'll occasionally you'll do a couple up. stitches yeah, or whatever. Yeah. I don't like to do it, but Come I can on. do it. Come on, there's a surgeon inside of you. Um, what do I, do I play music? I think mine are so quick in the yeah. most part that I really don't set up a whole yeah. music and you're talking the whole time with your pay you're a conversationalist yeah my pe my person's away they're not like it's not a surgery so yeah. i may be locally numbing but yeah yeah the one thing i'll tell you because i'm, I'm a, pa I'm a patient of with. his and i don't know if you are as well but he's my internist uh, dr toll and I'm, I'm um, the one be, awkward part about seeing your internist i always find so awkward is you have to get you have to take your clothes off it's yeah. so weird yeah. and that's just like i don't know if you it's for funny. you it's not weird Wait, at all so, you take your clothes off it's funny yeah. well, it's funny because <laughs> do a full exam i think okay. for my my closest friends that if they're my patients mm -hmm. for the very intimate things like prostate exams and yeah. stuff i'd i'd really re think it's more comfortable if they would see a urologist <laughs> just for that one thing this is a message to jeff's close friends <laughs> but for, you know for the rest i don't know yeah Whatever. yeah yeah but do do um do you feel discomfort Examining because we examine people with their clothes on. That's the reason we chose facial plastic surgery. Yeah. Uh, we don't have to look at people um, naked. Do you feel point, like that's a weird thing or no? Not really. You know what? It doesn't even bother you. I don't really notice it anymore. That's I think cool. when you start, you do, you know, but it's just. But you kind of get It's used like to you're it. looking at the inside of someone. If I had to look at some under someone's skin on their face, <laughs> yeah. I would throw, vomit. <laughs> And he's comfortable doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I can, you know, whatever. <laughs> and tell us yeah. about, so you were also uh, have an institute where you were treating migraines. I do, yeah. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. And what are, you, yeah. what are your modalities of treatment? And, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that. It's a, it's a whole other topic. And it sounds kind of weird because I'm doing facial plastics. But um, there's obviously a lot of people know about treating migraines with Botox. Um, there's a whole theory around migraines, which I happen to believe in. How do you but, treat migraines with Botox? Migraine, actually, Botox is FDA approved, meaning the government has approved it to use for Botox, uh, for um, migraines. And um, there's a very, very strict protocol where you inject a certain amount of Botox in certain places around the face and neck. And in double blinded, placebo controlled phase three studies, it showed efficacy, um, like actually wow. pretty, pretty strong efficacy. The, the funny thing is, a lot of neurologists do this treatment. Mm -hmm because it's approved and it works, but there's also a lot of controversy about why it works. So, um, Is it because the muscles get weaker and they're not clenching down as much? So the traditional explanation is that you're basically relaxing muscles around nerves that could be triggering migraines. Um, I actually happen to believe that the, the Botox itself works on, directly on the nerves, um, which is, hasn't been borne out so much in the research yet where it, cause it doesn't really make sense, right? You're injecting to into certain areas where literally the nerve isn't around any muscle in certain places. And so you're, you're explaining it by saying the muscle around the nerve is relaxing, but there's no muscle around the nerve. So how are you 
explaining it. And to clarify, so Botox weakens the muscles. Yeah. That's typically how Botox, that's why it gets rid of wrinkles in the face. So you're saying that your hypothesis is that it's actually weakening, doing something to the nerve. It's it's sort of, it's almost like turning the volume down on the nerve a little bit. Oh, interesting. And um, the, the way I explain it is that, you know, obviously we all, I mean, anyone that has a migraine has been to a doctor, people in medicine know that migraines are happening in the brain. There's no question about it. So people are sort of wondering why are you injecting Botox in the face and the neck and the shoulders for something happening in the brain. And the best way to explain it is that if you think about it, some of the nerves in the neck or in the shoulders in the face, they're like fuses. And that fuse gets lit and it sends a signal to the brain where kind of the, the bomb goes off, right? So if you can turn down the volume on those fuses, if you can desensitize those fuses, you can turn down the volume on the migraines. And what that usually looks like is decrease in frequency, meaning number of migraines per month, decrease in pain, meaning the amount of pain you have with each migraine, and decrease in uh, how long they last. Um, and in some patients, I mean, this is this is more the exception than the rule. You actually get rid of them. Wow. Um, so in my Long mind- Long term, they don't have to repeat the Botox. Well, they have to get Botox. You have to get Botox every okay. three to four months. Got but, it. But if you're doing regular Botox, they get off their meds, you know, they're- Wow. They're more, you know, it's not, it's not always the case. It's usually more of a reduction- and but, when would you uh, suggest patients consider this as a treatment? Like if a person gets a migraine, you know, once or twice a year, yeah. are they a candidate for this? Or is it someone who's getting migraines daily or weekly? Like when when are they a candidate? So I'm gonna I'm probably going to get skewered for this by the neurologist, but there's yeah, a lot. Yeah, we'll have of, one on to, just to <laughs> answer it. Next but, week, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the migraine Botox is approved for people with chronic migraines. Chronic migraines means like 14 or more a month. You, Jeff knows the definition better than I do, I'm sure. Um I happen to believe that Botox works really well for, or can work for anyone with suffering from migraines. And I also think the way we think about migraines is a little backwards because first line therapy for migraines nowadays is medication. And if you talk to any migraine sufferer, they will tell you either their medication doesn't work very well, or the side effects are terrible, or the migraines are getting worse on the medication when they don't take it. Um, Botox, in my mind, is even if it doesn't work, trying it once to see if it improves the migraines, in my mind, should be the first line because Botox has minimal side effects. Um, it's Is that easy usually to do. covered by insurance if someone's doing it for no. this purpose? It, no. It's very it'll, hard. It'll, it'll need a prior authorization, so you'll need to fail... You'll, you'll need to fail medical... Uh, Management? Oral options, and then probably get it authorized. Is that accurate for you? You're probably not yeah. doing insurance. I'm not doing insurance, but I know that you have first of all, you have to meet these very specific criteria, yeah. which mm. most people don't meet, which right. is a certain number of migraines for a certain amount of time on therapy, on therapy, on maximal therapy. Yeah. Um, so and- I, my understanding was always that migraines were actually va- like vasospasm in mm. the in the brain, and so the ma- most of the drugs that we use are things to target like calcium channel blockers, things that will decrease the vasospasm, and then medications like the triptans and things like that yeah. that do the same thing. So vasospasm meaning they're not getting enough like the blood vessel. flow? The well, we don't know if it's whether they're not getting enough blood flow or there's a backflow of blood flow or there's something about the blood flow. Oh, and on most of the, I think, but they don't really know. These mm-hmm. are all like theories that are unproven in any way. Yeah. And none of the medications that would go along with the theories really work. And so that's why they're constantly looking for new solutions. Because it would be one thing to say, this is because of vasospasm. Right. You give them a medication that cures vasospasm and then the migraines yeah. go away, but that's not, that's the, not case. the case. That's not the case, okay. And so they're constantly looking for, because there's this type of, there's something in the heart that can happen called uh, Prinz metals angina, where you get like a vasospasm and it causes actual chest pain. You can actually have your troponins go up. And that type of thing is thought to be similar to, or like if you've heard of Raynaud's in the hands mm-hmm. where the hands can turn different yeah. colors and that gets cured by Botox too, interestingly enough. Wow. And so I'm, so I think there's something about, I think the, the, the vessels are innervated by the nerves also. And so there's probably, it ends up being something about the, yeah. the, the, the smooth muscle on the vessels that are controlled by the nerves must be what's being affected. Yeah, because you do have all the smooth muscles on the actual vasculature. Yeah. And even to your point about it affecting the nerves, because there are little tiny microscopic muscles, right? That, you know, we yeah. don't even like analyze and calculate, but don't 
do the nerves have little tiny pulley systems with the musculature, with the you know connective tissues around it that the Botox like may be working on? Like muscles, like very yeah. or the smooth muscle of the vessels and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You no, know, mm-hmm. to your point, Jeff. I you know that that ties directly into the theory because the trigeminal vascular system, which is the trigeminal nerve, which is a cranial nerve, it ties in to a lot of the nerve endings in the brain on these vessels. And so the theory is that these branches of nerves that we're treating, which are branches of the trigeminal nerve mostly, um, which send signals directly to the brain, it bypasses the the spinal cord. By down-regulating those nerves, you're down-regulating that signal that then may end up on these nerve branches on the vessels. Yeah, that makes sense. Causing them to spasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're very, I mean, no one really knows. They've shown yeah. that that Botox downregulates some sensory nerve signaling. They talk about substance P, which is something that comes up with pain. Um, but I just find like dramatic improvement for a lot of patients who have been literally suffering for years and been told mm-hmm. by their doctors they're not a candidate for Botox. It won't work for you. You don't qualify. And to me, it's kind of like if you could come into an office and get injections once every three or four months and not take a lot of these medicines and not suffer. What, mm-hmm. I mean, what, what's the downside in trying it at least? I know? totally yeah. agree. Totally agree. They also need to go outside, relax, take care of yeah. their my, mental oh, yeah. health. Mm-hmm. That's number one. A lot of these things help migraines tremendously. Totally. Yeah. So yeah. I'm also someone who doesn't love to have people on chronic medications if they don't need to be. And I also think that most medications are double-edged swords. Hopefully there's more benefit than risk. But every medication has potential side effects, potential toxicity. So I don't like people to be on anything if they don't have to be. Right. So yeah. I agree if, you know, you know, people, I've seen people benefit very well from your Botox injection. So I think it's yeah. definitely something to consider. Yeah. And I, I just really sympathize with these people, though. Yeah, totally. It's such a miserable, hard thing to go through to have chronic pain or chronic headaches. It's just so difficult. So, you know, I'm glad that there's people like you who are trying to help and, you know, people like you Maybe are trying to help. Maybe they can watch and- your TikTok videos. And <laughs> Maybe that'll cure it. I think that's causing a lot of the headaches. Yeah, it's like epilepsy for the... <laughs> I'm going to do my first TikTok <laughs> dance video just for you, Josh. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> well, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Cabin, and giving us so awesome. much insight into your incredible practice. So where, we, if uh, people are listening and they want to... Yeah you know, consult with yeah. you or use your services? How, do how best you? do they find you? So my website is facebh, F-A-C-E-B-H.com. You can Face-B-H. find me there. Facebh.com. Yeah, I mean, we're actually, this week, we're rolling out online appointments to bypass a lot of the headaches of calling and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, cool. Actually, Deepak Dugar introduced me to the company that does it. <laughs> Great, yeah, I'm super excited out, for So you, that'll yeah. be easier for patients. Yeah, um, you're going to love it. And then I'm on Instagram. I'm, I, I talk a lot about social media, but I really shouldn't because I'm not that good at it. But uh, jcabinmd, at jcabinmd, probably the two best places to, Perfect. to find me. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all your expertise. Uh, you are a uh, master at so many different things. Oh, man. And that's you sound so like great. an artist, the way you describe the face. Were you yeah. an artist uh, growing up or do you draw? Um, I don't. Should I say I do? I don't know. No. Just I the do. way you describe the shadows, the way, the way you describe it. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a very artistic, and I wonder if in plastic surgery, when you when they're teaching you guys, do, are they showing you things like that? Ironically, they don't. Like yeah, it's so funny. Should. You would think that, that it would be a big part of it. You don't study it's like not, it's all anatomy. It's just yeah. they're hardcore focused on you learning the anatomy. Right. The art of it you learn in fellowship is what both of us would probably agree on. Yeah, so during do, residency, do you, you don't teach your this. fellows. You have a fellow, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually know your fellow. Yes, one of your fellows yeah. this yeah. year. We went to yeah. medical school together. Yeah. So, so that's not something that, I guess that's like outside the curriculum, but something that. Yeah, I think it depends on your mentor. Yeah. Like, oh, your, your mentors really guide your careers. Plastic surgery is something that's truly taught to you and handed right. down. Like no plastic surgeon out there just made it on their own. Every single plastic surgeon, and you'd agree to this, it's all from their mentors, whoever your yep. mentors are. And it's usually a collective of mentors, not like one. Usually you yep. have multiple mentors. Mine being Dr. Kenodia, of course, yours, Dr. Azizadeh, and yep. your New York City mentors from your residency. You know, you have yep. lots of mentors. Um, but both of us are kind of, you know, I think all plastic surgeons, you, you're definitely molded by your mentors because they're the ones who teach you the art of it because they've learned it over the years. Yep. You know, one one thing Dr. Kenodia so you're a Jedi master. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to learn. Yeah, he's my Yoda. Um, <laughs> one thing Dr. Kenodi always told me that I still sticks with me till today, and uh, I can't wait till he comes to the podcast. But um, he told Is me he that. Come? Yeah, All absolutely. Right. We're I super excited. Him. Yeah, Dr. Toll invited him. We I want to be a spectator for that one. Yeah. Oh, it's gonna be great. But one thing he told me when he was uh, even younger as a kid, he would. Uh, 
on airplanes. He was like, I'm so bored, you know, for six hours. And this is like, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there's no TV, there's no entertainment, right? No so all you have is magazines. There's nothing, just no. magazines, you know? And so he would literally just rip out the pictures of pretty girls and he would just study them. And he would say, why is she so pretty? And he would stare at it for hours just to understand why he had this spiritual or intellectual moment of attraction to this face. So interesting. And I love that. And he's done this for years. Even today, like he'll come to the office sometimes Literally, I'm not kidding you. And he'll ha have like five or six ripped out magazine photos. But like, look at these faces. And he's so excited about it. And I love that. It's that's like awesome. This, that's cool. He, that's he truly loves, yeah, he loves beauty. But that's where I understood how the art and beauty goes into it. But no one in school ever taught me that. And know? I think that what you said is totally true from the mentors. And I also think plastic surgery, there is a personal aesthetic. And that's yeah. another reason why you want to find someone carefully. Right. You know, um, I always tell people, and this, I'm, I may get, slam for this too but like if you look at someone's website or their office and it doesn't appeal to you aesthetically you may want to think twice about going to that person for your surgery because or their face or their face <laughs> um yeah. because you're you're trusting you know you learn all these things from your mentor you learn all these things from the person that trained you but then you're the guy in the operating room saying does this look the way i want it to look does this please me aesthetically yeah. um and so i think that that differentiating factor too i appreciate aesthetics i'm you know, I, I'm more of like a minimalist when it comes to aesthetics. I think that's where Deepak and I see eye to eye and a lot yes. of things. I like, even though I do open rhinoplasty, you do closed, I like to try to disrupt as little as possible because I feel like 100%. medications, the body knows best. And if you can do as minimal movements as possible to get the outcome you want, you want the body to do, you know, Absolutely. Everything, or so. no movements. Yeah. My favorite is not operating. I literally yeah, you did a great job on mine. I, I love not <laughs> operating. You did good not operating on mine. Yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah. Did you just, go up for a consult? Yeah. Yeah. I made him pay full price for his consult. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Kennedy is going to bring in a picture of your face. Check out. <laughs> Look at this beauty. Yeah, that's a beauty. <laughs> I rejected Jeff. He's too good looking. That's <laughs> a beauty. Well, thank you for joining yeah. us today. Thank we you guys. really this appreciate really your insight. Yeah. yeah our anytime. Pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening today. We had a great conversation. Really cool to get a different view of facial plastic surgery. I loved it. Yeah, it was really cool. And uh, a lot of cool insights. And I, it's so interesting though. he's a migraine expert too. Like that's so he, interesting. He really has a lot of different skills too because yeah. in their practice, they have some ENT docs that do some cancer stuff. Yeah. So sometimes at the end, like let's say someone has a parotid tumor. So yep. that's like a tumor of the salivary gland. Mm -hmm. So I think it's Dr. Larian. So if Dr. Larian takes out that tumor, then Dr. Cabin will come in and, and fix this, you know, Cosmetic make, it look, stuff. make it, you know, as beautiful as it can yeah, look yeah. afterwards. And yeah, he, I love that um, holistic he, approach to Yeah, the it's head very neck. cool. Yeah, and then very, the, he's done some uh, laceration repairs for me, oh, uh, cool. you know, for all some patients. Yeah, very cool. And stuff like that. So I love that. I love that. So it was great having him on and we're going to have a lot more really cool guests. So stay tuned, guys. We have some really cool doctors, uh, some more really huge celebrity influencers coming up soon. Uh, so stay tuned. Keep listening. Keep sharing. Keep rating us. Got to share the show more. Yeah, share the show right and, now. And send, send it to questions. a friend. If you made it to this point in the show, this is the secret message yeah. part. Okay. If you made it to this point of the show, <laughs> that means you are special and you are chosen. And we need you to do us a big favor yes. and send this to a friend right now. Gotta send <laughs> we it. love you. <laughs> God bless. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening.